Google has released Big Bench, possibly the mother of all benchmarks. Will it drive the next breakthroughs in AI? Is this classic anti-competitive tech behavior from Google to displace other benchmarks? And what does this mean for financial AI? First of all, the paper has a monster author list with over 350 authors. This is undoubtedly due to its open source nature. It's a flexible benchmark allowing contributors to add tasks. We'll cover the rationale and process for contribution, but first, a brief history of benchmarks in artificial intelligence. Benchmarks and the open competition that they foster have been crucial to neural network history. Many would point to ImageNet, a computer vision classification competition as one of the earliest and most important data set and benchmarks. Largely, that's true, though a few medical imaging competitions for example, in cell segmentation, reviewed GPU-accelerated approaches had impressive abilities prior to 2012. Scholars of computer vision will have read about Dan Sarisen, Sepp Hochreiter, and Jürgen Schmidt-Huber's success there. Greater fame and fortune eluded them, as unlike Alex Krzyzewski of AlexNet fame, they did not release open source code to accelerate adoption and verification. As most trained research scientists would describe, science progresses in fits and starts. Scientists, and especially computer scientists, are a deeply skeptical bunch. Much like early physical scientists, computer scientists verify results through their own experiments, a process so common to be known as repro in industry parlance. To quote the famous physicist Feynman, what I cannot create, I don't understand. Physicists would have loved the open source collaborative nature of computer science. Thus, the direction of Big Bench is twofold. First, there's establishing a new benchmark to drive progress. Big Bench specifically targets natural language understanding, or NLU. NLU has historically been stimulated by seminal benchmarks from Stanford, the General Language Understanding Evaluation Benchmark, GLU, and its successor, SuperGLU. GLU was quickly dominated by neural network approaches using architectures such as RNNs and LSTMs. SuperGLU was quickly instituted with a vision to present a target for researchers for years to come. It took a quantum leap forward in architecture to fell the 10 benchmarks in SuperGLU. The novel and extremely parallel transformer architecture conquered the diverse tasks ranging from sentiment analysis, entailment, does one phrase imply another, to co-reference resolution. Did it understand what was alluded to earlier? In each of the tasks, Transformer models are at or exceeding human-level performance. All seemed ebullient in the kingdom of NLU AI. What then were the serious cracks in the approach? As the title of Big Bench suggests, what lies beyond the imitation game, the common name for the Turing test? Yet another level of history is that NLU scientists have nothing less than general intelligence as their objective. That is, a flexible, adaptable, human-like intelligence at peak performance. Language is undoubtedly what separates humans from the rest of the animal kingdom to provide complexity and coordination, to say the least. With regards to superglue, it was certainly a case of it being too easy, too good to be true. While the AI models that conquered superglue were tremendously useful for narrow tasks, they didn't have the flexibility to adapt to a myriad of tasks that humans face and even scientists work on, including vision and language and other niche problems. Scientists wanted to solve the domain adaptation problem, possibly with mountains of additional data. The main approach to different domains was to build larger models and shovel more data. In short, the approach was scale. Scale is near and dear to those in Silicon Valley. It's a somewhat natural idea, albeit requiring significant technical challenges and investments in computational hardware. OpenAI pursued scale with its GPT-2 and GPT-3 architectures, using internet scale datasets. While they extended to over 20 tasks and showed impressive results, they're themselves contributors to Big Bench. A quick tie-in to financial analysis. It could be argued, perhaps wrongly, an ultimate market AI is an AGI. First, AGI doesn't exist yet, so it wouldn't currently be feasible to use it. Second, an artificial general intelligence that isn't everywhere at the edge like market participants would fall short of a complete solution to market dynamics. With current technology, a sensible AI approach which should hang its powerful tools on a well-known theoretical framework, in our case, fundamentals and intrinsic valuation. Nevertheless, financial analysis is a deepening 
a domain for AGI because, to quote Coolidge, business is the business of Americans. That is to say, successful participants in the free world markets touch nearly every coordinated enterprise in the pursuit of happiness. Financial analysis benefits from the engagement with Big Bench, AGI, and open source acceleration of human ingenuity. Big Bench, as it applies to financial analysis, is very relevant to the domain problem. It's well known that financial markets are dynamic systems that don't repeat exactly in time due to active participants. Yet the repeated success of fundamental investors suggests there are universal business truths that drive prices. Intrinsic value investors are seeking advantageous characteristics prior to broad discovery by the market, with the expectation that the market eventually captures predictions over time. This is a multi-dimensional problem as evidenced by the 23 fundamental metrics we cover, such as forward price to earnings enterprise to EBITDA, free cash flow yield, etc. That needs to be dynamically weighted vis-a-vis -vis the natural language discourse from management. It requires a high level of generative and quantitative reasoning that maps well to tasks like analogical similarity and analytic entailment in Big Bench. Figure one of the Big Bench paper covers progress towards conquering natural language understanding. Scientists often use a trick to quickly grok a paper by inspecting the figures a technique that is accessible if the reader can explain current methods. We'll try to do just that. This figure shows it's a long way to AGI, and only the Pathways Language Model, Palm, actually scales with parameters towards AGI-level performance, that is, human-level performance in every tab. Figure 2 is an overview of the previous benchmark, Sweet Superglue. From the figure, we can see that Superglue lasted 18 months. Another way of viewing it is that language models have conquered narrow NLU tasks. If you have a framework to hang discrete tasks, such as the Amicus AI approach to investing, then transformer language models are already powerful tools. Figure 3 covers the different domains of the tasks. The tasks are heavy in common sense, logical reasoning, and programmatic, i.e. multi-round tasks that require several steps. There are many tasks with thousands of examples, which is a prerequisite for suitable machine learning to occur. Figure 4 breaks down the gap between humans and AI models. Winnow Y is at 80%, which suggests humans may not be good at explaining themselves to other people. The auto-debugging has no model performance, so it might be a very new task. Novel Stories and Strategies QA has decent performance already from models. The worst is Parsi NLU reading comprehension and repeat copy logic tasks. I believe these are multi-round tasks that historically require more model interaction and engineering. Figure 5 is a very tricky figure that has to be qualified. The figure relates to the calibration problem, or how well confidence scores match the stochastic distribution of the actual labels. For example, a prediction that is 70% confident would intuitively be correct 70% of the time. The Breyer score is a mean squared error on the probabilities. Bigger models are more accurate on multiple choice, but have worse confidence. Note, the Breyer score is only a relative metric. By definition, a probabilistic measure doesn't converge to one if the probability matches. This figure shows how the Breyer score can swing and doesn't converge to one for a single observation ever if the confidence score is not one. So this means that you shouldn't look at this figure on a scale of 0 to 1, unlike the other figures that are normalized. If probabilistically the contribution is, is right 70% of the time, you would get a score of 0. approximately 0.49 as in the figure. So this is this is a, takes a little bit more interpretation. The third part is bootstrapping, meaning a repeated selection on the data set, either randomly or via fold. From the wiki, another caveat is the Breyer score becomes inadequate for very rare or very frequent events, so bootstrapping can address this. Figure 6 says scaling actually does seem general, meaning they tested across leading architectures and hyperparameters. On the flip side, there's no real architecture innovation, though certainly significant technical challenges at scale. They emphasize sparse models. Sparse in this paper refers to sparsely gated mixture of experts, where parts of the network are switched on and off. Link to the sparse mixture of experts paper in the box below. Parameters that are higher by number are matched to computation by flops. And note, these the scaling is, is specifically on the tasks that scaling seems to work well on. Figure 7 covers linearity versus breakthroughness of different models. They're identifying three types, where performance scales linearly, where there's a step function in performance, 
and where it doesn't improve, where it's not clear whether there's a poor training setup. Worse, it seems vitamin C fact verification actually breaks down at scale. Investigating that paper, it's a specific contrastive setup that is fuzzing terms in the prompts and using models for fact checking. That falls into a caveat mTOR situation. Most practitioners know that language models are poor at precise math and would use the obvious tools for that instead. Figure eight, they do a further analysis of breakthrough via the probability of the correct answer. The probability is useful as that improves linearly even if the prediction accuracy doesn't. By probability, I mean the confidence here. As a practitioner, this would be captured by the cross entropy loss to some degree as it's a product of the predicted confidence with the true labels. Machine learning practitioners typical typically inspect the loss curve, so they suggest breakthrough performance is reflected by this loss curve. Figure 9 studies how multiple choice can reflect smooth performance, whereas exact match is breakthrough. This is sort of like a matching shape that exactly fits the, sh the square hole and doesn't appear surprising. Figure 10 says appending answers to prompts degrades performance, which is counterintuitive. It's not clear why but it could be a context separation between question and answer. Putting on our scientist hat, we could inspect the embedding overlap between question and answer as a measure of separability. The hypothesis is separability is the key factor. The experiment would be to determine separability as a covariant factor. Figure 11 is a bit tricky. A lower bias score is actually worse here. The score answers in their words, does a model show a systemic preference for members of one category over another or for associating particular attributes with particular categories? They measure template sentences swapping out, for example, proper nouns to measure how performance differs. This is a sensitive topic, especially when considering performance. Figure 12 and 13 are digging into bias further. Figure 13 suggests prompt engineering, that is changing the information provided to the model prior to answer can reduce bias. Now for the last three figures, we'll do a lightning round description. Figure 14 hints that different languages might require something more effective than simple scale. Figure 15 shows models on low resource languages identified by MC4 document count could encounter performance challenges. Figure 16 and surrounding discussions cover structured domain language interface problems like chess moves from a notation or a periodic table retrieval. More parameters seem to benefit here, but there's some subtlety, as you could be imagined by the domain complexity. What we won't cover today are the appendices. We went through about 25 pages, and there's about 25 pages more of appendices and 50 pages of citations, which I can certainly appreciate because it gives credit to uh, all the people that worked on this difficult problem. After reviewing the paper, the verdict is it has lived up to its hype. It's a more credible challenge to NLU researchers, throwing down the gauntlet for the next generation of AI wunderkinds.